each year the third year class also chooses a guest speaker. And it's my enormous pleasure to introduce today's commencement speaker, the Honorable John S. Tiger, a judge on the United States District Court for the Northern District of California. Judge Tiger is a graduate of Williams College where he majored in economics and English. He then graduated from Berkeley Law School, where he's a member of Order of the Coif and articles editor of the California Law Review. After law school, he clerked for Judge Robert Vance on the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. He then practiced complex commercial litigation at Kecker and Van Ness in San Francisco, worked as a trial lawyer in the San Francisco Public Defender's Office in the litigation department at Morrison and Forster. He then served as a judge on the Alameda County Superior Court for 11 years, where he was the presiding judge of the court's appellate division. In 2013, he became a judge on the United States District Court for the Northern District of California. Judge Tiger is a member of the prestigious American Law Institute, where he served as an advisor on Restatements Third of Torts. He also served as co-chair of the ABA Section Litigation's Federal Practice Task Force. And since 2017, he's been co-chair of the Federal Judicial Center ABA Antitrust Section Judicial Antitrust Education Program. And quite importantly, Judge Tiger has taught pretrial litigation here at Berkeley Law. He has a stellar reputation as a judge, and I cannot imagine a better role model for our graduates than today's commencement speaker, the Honorable John Tiger. I don't remember Dean Chemerinsky telling me there'd be so many people here. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction, Dean Chemerinsky. Good morning to you. Good morning to faculty, parents, friends, <clears throat> and good morning to the truly extraordinary graduating class of 2023. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me to be your graduation speaker. What an honor it is for me to address you. And what a joy it is for me to return to the very spot where I myself graduated in 1989. I have to tell you, it's just the way I'm put together that I choke up sometimes when I speak publicly and when I touch on subjects with a lot of positive emotion, and I'm feeling a lot of positive emotion right now. So forgive me in advance. I want to start by thanking and congratulating some of the folks who made today possible. You've heard some of these thanks already, but I'm not sure you could thank these folks enough. I want to acknowledge all the parents, spouses, partners, friends, and family here. Many of you, many of you made huge sacrifices to get all these wonderful graduates to this point, not just through law school, but for all the years before that. You did it because you love these students and you're so proud of them. And so to all of your supporters, I just want to say a big thank you. So thank you. I want to say a big thanks to everyone at Berkeley Law, the faculty, the administration, the librarians, the clerical staff, the cleaning crew, the baristas at the law school coffee shop, and all the other people who made it possible to open the door every day so you all could get this thing done. Thank you. And finally, congratulations to you, the graduating class of 2023. What an amazing group you are. 335 JDs, 242 LLMs, four JSDs, which is Doctor of Juridical Science, and three PhDs. You come from 40 different states and 55 different countries. Diversity is your strength. Two thirds of the entering JD class were women and 2% and 2% were non-binary or transgender. A majority of you were persons of color. More than 10% of you are first-generation college graduates. And while this is tough for me to admit, I've seen the data, and pretty much all of you had a higher college GPA than I did which confirms my suspicion that all of you are smarter than I am. 
From here, you're going on to work in private law firms, to enter public service, to take all kinds of interesting fellowships, to work for big law, to work for plaintiff's firms, to enter academia, to clerk for judges, to become judges, to continue being judges, and more other things than I have time to list. In your totality, you reflect the diversity of background and thought that have always made Berkeley Law a truly great institution. Congratulations on today's achievement. Just one last time, give yourselves a huge round of applause. <laughs> on a beautiful spring day, 34 years ago, I sat just where you're sitting. I was a little nervous, but mostly I was proud and happy. Proud to have finished three long years of legal training at a great law school with some of the best professors and students in the country. Happy to be beginning my life as a lawyer. Happy to be sitting next to Carrie Avery. I met Carrie when we were both 1Ls at Berkeley Law. She's one of the greatest graduates this law school has ever produced, and I've now been married to her for more than 31 years. Thank you, Carrie. The graduation speaker that day was Jerry Brown. The former, I didn't know that would be a laugh line. <laughs> the speaker that day was Jerry Brown, the former governor of California, who would later go on to become the governor of California. <laughs> I don't remember a word he said. And I take comfort in that because it means you probably won't remember anything I say either. <laughs> and that takes the pressure off a little. As you start your careers, I know many of you are wondering, how can I find meaning in the law? How can I find satisfaction? How can this profession keep alive in me the goals and values that prompted me to apply to law school in the first place? And today I suggest to you that part of the answer is to take this awesome power you now have and all the enthusiasm that got you this far and use them to achieve justice for others. First, first do justice by upholding the rule of law and safeguarding our democratic society. We read in the, we read in the news every day about attacks on our democratic institutions about attempts to restrict the right to vote, about politicians who attempt to undermine the legitimacy of our court system by politicizing judges' rulings, about attempts to restrict certain voices from being heard in our schools and legislatures. But those efforts do not reflect the sentiments of the majority of your fellow Americans. Most Americans cherish our democracy and they cherish the rule of law. I know that's true because of the thousands of jurors I have spoken to and the hundreds of new American citizens I have sworn in and they tell me it's true. The proverb says, justice resides naturally in people's hearts. And I think so does their faith in democracy. I love my country. I love my court. And I cherish the opportunity to do justice every day by upholding the rule of law. But the rule of law is something we must all protect together. I will never forget the juror more than a decade ago who served as an alternate in a three-week trial I conducted when I was a judge on the Alameda County Superior Court. An alternate juror hears all the testimony and argument and is available to substitute in if one of the other jurors gets sick or needs to be absent for some other reason. So if you're an alternate juror and you're not substituted in, you do all the work and you give up all those days of your life, but you don't get the satisfaction of deciding the case. The judge just excuses you and you go home. And this gentleman did that in a three-week trial I presided over and he had done the same thing before in another three-week trial, meaning serve as an alternate but not get to deliberate and he was a veteran of the United States Army who had served two tours of combat duty abroad. As I was excusing him, 
I thanked him for his jury service as an alternate, and I felt like he deserved a particularly special acknowledgement because of his prior service as an alternate. I told him I thought it must be frustrating to have spent six weeks in two separate trials without the payoff of getting to deliberate. And I thanked him for that. He responded, Your Honor, I put my life on the line twice so you could do this. This, being an alternate, was a walk in the park. I remember swearing in more than a thousand new citizens at the Paramount Theater in Oakland in September 2017. They cheered and they waved American flags. Some of them were so happy, they cried. If you've never been to a citizen swearing in ceremony, I urge you to go. You've never seen such patriotism, such uncynical belief in the power of American democratic institutions. Faithful adherence to the rule of law is a bedrock principle of our democracy. But the rule of law is only as strong as the will and the effort of the people charged with upholding it. Starting today, that's you. If you're admitted to the California bar, you'll take an oath to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of California. In other states, you'll take a similar oath. That oath is a promise to uphold the rule of law. Upholding the rule of law means applying the law evenly, without fear or favor. But it also means bringing to account those who would try to weaken the rule of law. It means being willing to step forward to guard the rule of law from attack by any source, no matter how mighty and no matter the consequence. So I ask you to stand up for the rule of law to step forward and you see others trying to weaken it, to stand up for our democratic institutions. We need your energy, your passion, and your commitment. Second, I hope you will do justice by helping others get justice, determined not by how much justice they can afford, but by how much justice they need. Probably not a good look to drink out of a can at the microphone, I don't know. <laughs> Getting kind of warm up here. From here, some of you will answer the call to public service. Some of you will work in public interest firms. For you, doing justice will be part of the fabric of your work. But whether you're in a plaintiff's personal injury firm, a prosecutor's office, a corporate law firm, a public defender's office, or something else, you will have the opportunity to do justice. Because the need for justice is everywhere. I've spent more than half my career in public service as a law clerk, a deputy public defender, a state court trial judge, and now as a federal judge. But I also spent more than a decade in corporate law practice. And everywhere I've been, I've had the chance to do justice. Doing justice is not just the right thing to do, it's also the most satisfying thing you can do. In my law practice, before I became a judge, I represented all kinds of clients. Some of the cases I handled involved hundreds of millions of dollars, and no question, those cases were fun and rewarding. But nothing gave me more satisfaction than the cases I did for free. Like the client referred to me by legal aid, who said she had a tax problem. Her real problem wasn't taxes. Her problem was that she was a victim of domestic violence, whose abusive husband was siphoning off the money from their jointly owned business. And once I helped her find the inner strength to bring her husband to justice, it became clear whose responsibility the tax problems really were, and it wasn't her. Or the single mother, <clears throat> excuse me, or the single mother in the tenderloin, a survivor of cancer, raising two teenage girls on a secretary's salary, buried in debts she could never pay, who might still be mired in those debts today if I had not successfully fought them in court. There are so many people, just like these, who need your help right now. It has been estimated that every year there are at least 23 million unrepresented people in the non-criminal courts, including civil, family law, probate, and housing. Every one of them could use a lawyer, but not a single one can afford a lawyer. 
So whether it's all of your practice or only a part of it, my advice to you is to give freely of your talents to those who most need them. To heed the words of Brian Stevenson, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, who said, the true measure of our commitment to justice, the character of our society, our commitment to the rule of law, fairness and equality cannot be measured by how we treat the rich, the powerful, the privileged, and the respected among us. The true measure of our character is how we treat the poor, the disfavored, the accused, the incarcerated, and the condemned. There will be times when it feels easy to achieve justice. But there will also be times when it feels very hard. The hard times are not when you give up. That's when we really need you. And don't worry if you can't always see all the way to the end of the path towards justice. As the writer Barbara Kingsolver once said, the arc of history is longer than human vision. It bends. So today, I invite you to begin your careers in the law by putting yourself on the path towards achieving justice for others, a path described by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the last sermon he gave at the Bishop Charles Mason Temple in Memphis, Tennessee. He said, let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination. And let us move on in these powerful days, these days of challenge to make America what it ought to be. We have an opportunity to make America a better nation. I loved what your student speaker said a minute ago when they said, you're so much more than lawyers. So before I sit down, let me leave you with one more thought, which is to make sure you nurture within yourselves the qualities that make you great people as well as great lawyers. To live in the real world, not just in your office. Doing nothing but reading cases and writing briefs might sharpen your writing, but it will dull your perspective. Make sure you're just as invested in your relationships with your friends, your loved ones, and your community as you are in your relationship with your clients and the courts. And take care of yourselves by doing things that bring you joy. For me, those things have included family, friends, and among other things, poetry. So I'm going to close with one of my favorite poems, a poem by Marge Piercy that I think sums up the kind of lawyer and person I hope you'll be that I hope you'll want to be. And her poem is called, To Be of Use, and it goes like this. The people I love the best jump into work head first, without dallying in the shallows, and swim off with sure strokes, almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element, the black, sleek heads of seals bouncing like half-submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves, an ox to a heavy cart, who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud. Botched, it smears the hands, crumbles to dust. But the thing worth doing well, done, has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Greek amphoras for wine or oil, Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums. The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. Congratulations again on graduating from Berkeley Law. I've been so honored to be with you. I look forward to seeing you in court. Thank you.